Alrighty, and welcome to those who are watching online as well. If you haven't been able to join us in person this morning, hope you can catch up later. So, if you can bring it back in now, those in the room, uh, for those in line, I've just been talking about what they remember most from their wedding ceremony, and there, there is a reason for that. Last month, last month, we, uh, we talked about the three, I guess, interwoven elements of the Christian faith. It's hard to boil the Christian faith down to just three things, but if you did, it would be these three great loves, if you like, these three relationships and responsibilities. Love God, love each other, and love the lost, those who haven't yet made their way back to the family of God. And as I kind of mulled over this a little bit, well, not a little bit, quite a lot with other leaders in the church and with, with many of you, and the one, the one love, the one of those three that really seems to stand out at the moment as, as something to grow in, as something that's so important for us, especially right now, something to mull over, to really take seriously, is that love one another, that middle one, love one another. Uh, you might call it unity. You might call it reconciliation or, or oneness with each other or being family or being the church or being Christ's body, any of the ways that the Bible describes this particular relationship uh, and this particular responsibility on the flip side. Last week I was focusing on a different key area. The third one, love the lost, telling others about Jesus. And when I was talking about that, I used this analogy of families, establishing and growing families. So how the natural birth of a child is like the spiritual new birth of, of a new disciple of Jesus. That is spiritual new birth. And, and so somebody becoming a, a Christian, becoming a disciple of Jesus, is like a new person coming into the family, a new baby. It's not a burden for us to be involved in that, of course. It's not like, oh my goodness, this huge responsibility of, being, uh, of having a new person, although it is a responsibility. It actually brings joy, and it actually brings purpose and meaning, and there's a lot of good in it seeing a new life born. But staying with that same analogy of the family and the natural and then the spiritual family, God's family, there's this natural thing called marriage from which comes children. If new Christians are like babies being born into a family in the natural, the church, you and I, Christians in relationship, is like the relationship of a husband and wife of a man and woman. And from the very beginning of the Bible, marriage is essentially this, two becoming one. That's, that's basically it at its core. And so our, it's a union. And so our theme for the month is going to simply be this one word, one, one. What does it mean, really, that the church is meant to be like a marriage. Yes, with Jesus, if you know that analogy and picture in the Bible, but also with each other, to be one with one another, not just friends with, but one with one another. Jesus talks about it and he prays about it. Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, he wrote lots about it. And all the way through the Bible is this principle that it shaped the way Jesus did life, it shaped the way his followers did life, and the way we are meant to do life as well, being one. What does that mean? Well, let me pray, and then we're going to um, get into it. God, thank you so much for the privilege of sharing from your word this morning. And uh, I pray for your help, God, to do this. I pray that you would help us to listen to your spirit this morning through the scriptures, through your word. And I pray you would open our hearts to put you first and to receive what you have to give us in Jesus' name. I mean, today we're going to start in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and end in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. I promise we'll be done by at least 1 p.m. <laughs> Genesis starts like this. If you don't know the Bible, there's uh, 66 books that make all, it, all of it up together. Uh, about three quarters of that's the Old Testament, then there's the New Testament after, during, after Jesus' life. Um, Genesis right at the beginning, and it starts like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And basically, cutting to the chase, it was good, what God created. 
Part of that creation was us. God made the human from the dust and breathed his own life into this human being. And humanity was then also made to create. He said, be fruitful and multiply. From the very beginning of the Bible, we see something just from this first chapter or so about God and about humanity, a principle that runs all the way through that is essentially this. Who God is determines what God does, not the other way around. And what God does determines who we are, and what we are determines who we are, determines what we do. So, for example, one of the things that God is, is creator. He is creator, so what does he do? He creates. Because he creates, what are we? We are creation. And because we are creation, with his imprint image on us, what do we do? We recreate, procreate, we multiply. All the way through the Bible, we see this in effect. And whenever we try to reverse it, go from the bottom up, it goes pear-shaped. Whenever it's what we do makes us who we are, it always flops. Have you ever tried to prove your identity, your value, your worth by doing something? Something to impress, something to please, something to achieve something? Me too. If you were to ask me what's the thing that I find most challenging about following Jesus, I would not say the call to make disciples, to teach the Bible, to understand and meditate on the Bible, to, to preach the gospel, to seek justice, to bring... None of that. I would say the most challenging thing is not letting myself try to determine who I am by what I do. That is the hardest thing I find. Because it's letting go of pride. It's letting go and, and admitting that I can't do anything to make me who I am. Only God can. Now, God created, and it was all good, until the first time something is said that it wasn't good was when the human being he created was alone. That was not good. Why? Same principle. Who is God? God is not and individual. God is not an individual. God is a family. Father, Son, and Spirit in perfect relationship with each other. God is a family. So because of who he is, he makes and reproduces family. And so he, he made us to be family. So he made woman to be with man and man to be with woman for them to be family together. But more than that, who is God? God is this family who is several, Father, Son, and Spirit, but also fully one. God is one. He is united. So God makes family to be one, united, who then procreate more families to be one, to be united. I remember hearing about a minister who officiated a wedding, and in the script, he, he had a typo on his page. It was meant to say that today the bride and groom become united. Instead, it said, today the bride and groom become untied. Bad typo. Only one letter out of place, but you don't want to make that mistake. So in Adam and Eve coming together, what we have later will be called marriage, and that definitely does not mean being untied. In fact, it's the opposite. It's like being tied together, united. And it's one kind of relationship, marriage, in the scriptures that is called, later called covenant. And that is all about that, two becoming one. Two becoming one. To finish the Adam and Eve story, basically their oneness with God, their unity with, with God and with each other is broken because they choose themselves as first priority. That's basically the essence of sin. And they break the world. That's 
what happens. Now, I'm happy to have a conversation with you another time for the sake of time about why that is. Why did they break the world through this? But it basically, it's that their oneness in family can't have me-ness, can't have selfishness in there. So they broke it. Skip forward a few chapters. I know we're still in Genesis, but don't worry, we will be done by 1 p.m. A man named Abram. You may know him as Abraham, but his name is not that yet. At this point, his name's Abram, and he's given a promise by God that he will have children. And God does something to establish this covenant, this promise with him. There was a ritual in that culture where you took some animals, you cut them in half, you spread the pieces, and you walked together down the path of blood. Really gross, really weird. What on earth is going on there? I know. Part of their culture, it was a symbolic thing. They walk between the pieces, and what that symbolized is that the two parties were now bound to becoming one. They were bound by their promise to one another, their relationship with one another, the the agreement, and this is covenant, to becoming one. God is restoring in this picture the broken unity, the broken oneness that existed between God and Adam and Eve, And he now gives this new couple, many generations later, Abram and Sarai, he gives them a new name. So Abram became Abraham and Sarai became Sarah. Now this is in part because of the change in the meaning of those names. They mean slightly different things, Abram and Abraham. But also, something's happening. In Hebrew, God just gave each of them one letter of his own name. A part of God, because the name very much represented the identity of the person. A part of God is given to each one of this this couple. There's a restoration of unity happening. Becoming one again. Covenant to becoming one. Now, Abram and Abraham and Sarah, now their descendants would be the Israelites, from whom one day, now I'm skipping over like 40 40 other books, uh, they would one day result in a guy called Joseph and a girl called Mary. And uh, with the, the sin, the, the self-first mentality, it was thought that that was carried through the male bloodline. And so Mary, the, the, the female, becomes pregnant miraculously, just in a, in a similar way to her great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother Sarah, who got pregnant at an old age. This Jesus, who is the product of this, uh, this pregnancy, would one day be identified as the Son of God, part of the God family, Father, Son, and Spirit, and he, Jesus, would go about his task to show people what God is like with a small bunch of followers or friends he considered family. And one day Jesus would tell this little family of disciples that his blood not animals' blood, like the other covenant, but his blood would be poured out as a, what? New covenant. A new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Then his blood was spilled, but he rose from the dead, revealing his divine identity once and for all, but before returning to heaven, said, the game's not finished yet, another member of my God family, the Spirit, is coming. Wait for him. And at one point when he told them this, this, he breathed on them. He breathed on his friends. Just like when God breathed into the first human and gave him life. Then his blood was spilled. Uh, sorry, gave him life. His blood was spilled. He, he said, and he rose, then he rose from the dead. So the Spirit's coming. Wait for him. And then this little family that was around Jesus, they did wait. And a few days later, this spirit did come. And the effect, among other things, was that they lived in a way that they were one. Completely united with one another. Everything on the table, nothing between them. They shared meals, gave everything, submitted to one another, no one in need. Community that was so attractive that people joined in daily. So that's kind of Genesis to Acts. 
almost to the end of the Bible, all the way through to the early church after Jesus. Why talk about all that? Well, first of all, I just isn't the Bible amazing? It's a collection of books written by a whole host of completely different people in different eras, and yet somehow there's a story woven all the way throughout it that could only be there because it's not just the work of human hands. It's incredibly complex sometimes, and it's, it's hard to understand, and it's frustrating, and it's surprising and confusing sometimes, but altogether it's simply too extraordinary to be just another book on the bookshelf. But I wanted to give that rundown in Genesis through to Jesus and his followers, not just to say, oh, look how cool the Bible is, but to make one important point, and that is that the concept of a relationship with God. To God, it is something far different to what we have come to believe it is. It's not just what we have come to think of as family or friendship or community. It's something far different. It comes from the very nature of God himself. Who God is, what God does, who we are, what we do. God is not just relational or family. He's many who are at the same time one. Complete unity while still diverse, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If God's nature is three persons with that kind of relationship, not just kind of best buddies or really close to one another, but literally one, what does that mean about us? Well, this month our different speakers, and um, John and Anna are going to share over the next couple of weeks, are going to, um, are going to share on that. What's it mean to be one? But essentially it's this. The church is made to be many who are one, as God is many who are one. One heart, one mind, one faith, one purpose, one desire, one cause, one motivation. You may remember I quoted a couple of weeks ago the Archbishop of Canterbury who said, how do we do this? Well, we cannot live for our cause to win. We must live for his cause to win. One cause, one motivation, one heart. And Jesus prayed this, Father, may they be one saying that us being one with God and with each other would show the world who God is, because that is who God is. So all we've got to do is just completely forgive and reconcile and seek to understand and unite with each other constantly. Now, it's because sin, it's because this me first attitude that broke the world in the first place, back with Adam and Eve, Jesus has fixed the separation with God on the cross by forgiving us. And so we just extend that forgiveness and reconciliation to others and oneness with each other is restored too. Simple, right? Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this recently, about, for starters, my own failing in this area. See, I reverse the order of that principle that I mentioned before, constantly. I reverse it. For example, who is God? God is Father. He he is a parent. That is what he is and that is what he does. So I'm his child. I'm loved as his kid. He thinks I'm superb. I ought to just live with an appreciation of that. That ought to be how I live. What I like to do is do this. Well, I do clever things. And I achieve impressive things. And I do great things that others need. So therefore, I am a superb person. And you know what? It does not work. Because actually, I don't always do clever things. And I don't always achieve impressive results. And most of all, I don't always do what is best for others. I let others down. And so then I don't feel like a superb person, but then what happens? I need to maintain that sense of value and I need to maintain that sense of who I am because of who I've said that I am, that importance and worth. And so I take the easy option. It's not me. I blame. Well, it can't be anything I did. So-and-so just doesn't understand. They just don't appreciate. They just don't. He just won't. They just can't. She just, that's, that's what I do. And then it, it does not work. 
It doesn't work. It's exactly what the first man did. The woman gave me the apple. It's her problem. But all that does is create separation from each other. And then that snowballs the issue. Now, if we need motivation to be one with each other, to be united and reconciled, the effect on the world separated from God is probably a good enough motivation. One person put it this way, division in the church creates atheism in the world. Ouch. But beside that, beside that effect, The effect that it has on us individually has got to be just as much of a motivation. When I choose to break actively, to break unity with one of you in my heart, in my mind, by placing blame, by not forgiving, by saying something, whatever it is, I've just reversed the order of things that God put in place again, saying I am better because of what I did or what you didn't do or whatever it might be. I just reverse it again. I'm trying to fix the problem with the way I created the problem. And it does not work. Gosh, it's hard because built into our DNA is choice. It's free, it was free will. And that means that I can choose me over God. And when you can't see God and you can't touch God and you can't seem to hear God, it's a lot easier to just try and form who we are with stuff we can see and we can grasp. But here's what God has done. He has given us the Spirit, one member of the God family, and placed the Spirit inside us to fight against that DNA we have that tends to choose me first so that we can actually choose God first. Even the first choice to receive that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, The faith that you need to start the journey and receive the Spirit, even that is a gift. And I really pray that some of you would would even make that choice for the first time today. And choosing God first restores more and more that unity, that oneness with family, with God's family, which by default begins to uh, uh, restore the oneness with each other. The unity with the God family restores the oneness with God's family. Like many parts forming a single body, it's the Spirit who makes us the body of Christ. So in summary, it's what God has done, sending Jesus to die for forgiveness of our sins and rise to give us new life. And it's what God is doing. His Spirit in us Those who believe, restoring unity between us and God that makes us who we are. That is what makes us who we are. And that is a family who, like God, are completely one with each other. And so what do we do out of who we are? Well, we seek that oneness more and more. We seek to just live out who we actually are more and more. That is what it means to be the body of Christ. That is what it means to be the church. But there are a few uh, names that describe us um, in the Bible, a few names that describe who and what the church is. One is the body of Christ. Many parts, and we'll talk about this more in future weeks, many parts together being one body, the body of Christ. But there's another image and, and name as well. After Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, and then the Israelites, and all the way through down to Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and then his disciples, and then eventually you've got Paul who writes most of the New Testament. After all of that, 65 books through the Bible, at the very end comes this vision of the future. The last book of the Bible called Revelation. And in that book, there's Jesus, the bridegroom, And there's the church, his bride. And if God is about restoring the oneness, the unity between himself and his people, then this would make sense, right? A wedding, two become one. But something struck me this week about a wedding ceremony. Now, you know how it works at a wedding. Uh, The groom is at the front. He's a little bit nervous. Oh, goodness, it's getting close now. This is, you know, everyone's looking at me. Bride's almost here, but she's still far away. And then word gets through that she's on her way now. 
She's almost here, and the excitement rises a little bit. Everyone's getting, and then, but still, when she gets here, when the car arrives, the bride, she's, she's at the back of the room, behind the door. Nobody can see. She's apart from the groom. She doesn't kind of rock up and straight away she comes close. She's apart from the groom. And only once some other little companions make their way uh, in through the door and to the front, she then slowly makes her way closer and closer and closer and closer to the groom until finally they are together. It's a picture. We were once far from Jesus, who is God himself, disconnected, but now we get the chance to come close and to be united with him. But why? Why now? What's special about the the wedding? Well, what happens before the wedding ceremony? What is the bride of doing all day? Getting dressed up, right? She dresses up. She gets clean. She's clothed in white, pure, spotless. And it's in that state that she comes to the groom ready for marriage for the two to become one. And this is a picture as well. Only when our old clothes, our dirty rags are thrown off, only when our sinful state is what they represent, is dealt with, Are we then worthy of a marriage with the groom, with Jesus? But in this case, it was the groom who took our dirty rags, our sins. It was the groom who left them at the cross that he died on and clothed us in white. It was Jesus who by his blood washed us, who made us clean. And that is the good news. So what would it take to become one as the church? I just borrow someone's rag because I didn't keep one for myself. (laughs) Thanks, Evie. What would it take to become one as the church? Well, I believe it takes the same as what it will take to become one with Jesus. It takes the same thing, leaving our dirty rags at the cross So we are clothed for a wedding, for a union. We can all try and force patience and gentleness and kindness and forgiveness out of us. That's like trying to squeeze honey out of a lemon. It doesn't work. The only thing that can work is laying our me first dirty rags down and being transformed by the Spirit into new people who are worthy of this marriage with Jesus and with his body. And so I have an invitation for you today. And what it's all about is going to come up on the screen, one bit after another. The first is to take your dirty rag, hold it in your hand, and recognize that it symbolizes all your sin. It symbolizes all your failings, past, present, Future, it symbolizes the sins that you know about and the sin and selfishness that you don't even know exists within you. Then I'm going to ask you to separate yourself from the body of Christ, to actually go outside and recognize that your sin and my sin has separated us from God and also causes division and disunity with the body, the church. And when you're outside, to talk about that to God, to ask for his forgiveness. When you've asked for God's forgiveness, throw your dirty rag, the cross is out there, throw your dirty rag at the foot of the cross, recognizing that it stops you from true unity with God and with his people. Fourth, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and eat it. This represents the fact that Jesus' body was broken for you and his blood was poured out and shed for you instead of you. The separation from God that we have, the source of life is what God is, who God is. The separation from God results in death 
but he died in your place. Thank him for that. And then finally, come back inside because you're now worthy of a relationship. You're worthy of this marriage with Jesus who is present through his people. You've not just been made worthy for Jesus by throwing down your dirty rag, but for his body, for his family. And something's going to happen to remind you of this, that you're worthy and welcomed in. Just like in a wedding, someone's going to kiss you. No, I'm just kidding. I just want to see your faces. (laughs) Did you really think I was going to make you receive a kiss from (laughs) someone? But someone from the same gender, if you are willing to let them, is just going to give you a hug. Now, if you're really uncomfortable with that, um, you can just put your hand out and shake their hand. That's okay too. But uh, John and Lynn here and Aaron and Yvonne on that door are just going to give you a hug because what does God the Father do when a dirty, disgraced, pigsty-stained, lost kid comes back to the family, if you know that story? What does the Father do? He embraces him. An unconditional welcome back into the family. What Jesus has done and what the Spirit is doing means that we are being drawn back into oneness with each other. And I pray that an embrace as we step back through the doors reminds you of that. You've been made worthy to be part of his body and part of his family. And I pray that the song that the team are going to play, God, we are who you say we are, that it also reminds you of your identity in Christ. One final word before we we do this and share in this meal and this symbolic kind of act together. I want to ask you to do this today if you're serious. This is a choice. Being a Christian actually means that you are now a transformed person. Your life belongs 100% to Jesus and his people. And so if you feel like you'd rather not not take part in a gesture that says, my life belongs to these people because it belongs to God, then that's okay. I'm not going to pressure you to do that at all. The family of God is to treat its friends like family. And if you want to just be our friends, that is totally fine. But once you're family, you're family. It's a commitment. And I'm not just talking about if you're not part of the Billabong family, you can't do this. I mean the family of God of which we are a part. And the kids are going to come down um, after it's getting close to the end for us. They're going to take communion if, if, if they're used to doing that as well because um, they will make that choice to commit to family when they're old enough. But as for us, it's our choice today and every day. It's our choice to put our dirty, sin-stained rags either back on and hold on to them or to throw them off and let Jesus make us one with God again and with each other. Father, as we spend this time to reflect on our own brokenness, by the incredible forgiveness that you have offered us through the death of your son, Jesus. We want to thank you. We want to spend this time just to be still with you, to take seriously our commitment to be a follower of Jesus, that it means being one with one another, that it means being united to one another, connected to one another, with nothing off limits. God, if in the past our choice to be a follower of Jesus has been half-hearted, where we've said we would take the relationship with you, but we have not wanted to give our whole selves to the body, we've asked for your forgiveness. We ask that you would shift our heart. We ask that you would transform us, you would fill us with your spirit again today, that we would be slowly united more and more with each other. Make us one. God. Amen.
So um, John, Lynn, Aaron and Yvonne, I'd love you to go first, um, take your communion and then you'll be ready um, for then the music team. So the music team can jump up and start playing once they're done and then everybody else can follow. <laughs> 